please give a warm welcome and applause for Bernard J. Tyson and Morgan Debon. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Bernard, welcome. Oh, welcome great to, to be here. Tech. Thank you so much for coming. So um, you have pretty deep roots in the Bay. So I wanted to start with maybe a little bit about your beginning and how you got to where you are today and um, how the Bay became your home. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you. It's great to see everybody. Uh, this is home, the Bay Area. I was born and raised in Vallejo. And uh, Vallejo's a great place, for those of you who may not know that. Great people came from Vallejo. <laughs> um, we've been through some situations like bankruptcy and stuff, but it was still good. And, um, but I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, most of my family here in the Bay Area. I lived outside of the Bay Area for uh, about 10 years, but the rest of the time has been in uh, Northern California. Mm -hmm. I uh, grew up in a great home with my mom, dad, and my uh, siblings. My mother was sick a lot when we were growing up, and that's how I got interested in healthcare. I used to go with my mom to the doctor, and she spent a lot of time in the hospital. And um, he was a fantastic doctor who cared for and about her, and he cared about us as a family. And, you know, I just assumed growing up that everybody was treated that way. Mm -hmm. Then I learned later that's not the case. And mm -hmm. that's how I started to get engaged in um, what today we call disparities of care, right. where people are treated differently based on, you know, race, other kinds of biases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I didn't tell you this backstage, but one of the things, and my dad's a doctor, he's a sickle cell doctor, so I grew up around a lot of healthcare inequities, and um, one of the reasons I was so excited that you were joining us today was so that we could talk a little bit about how technology has a, there's an opportunity in technology for us to reduce some of the digital divide in equity in, in healthcare, so I want to make sure we talk about that today. Sure. Um, so. Let's go back. You've been at Kaiser Permanente for 34 years. And I think as millennials, that's an unheard of number for us. <laughs> I can't even be, imagine being at Blavity for 34 years and I made it. So, yeah. you know, um, talk to us about like that career journey. I think a lot of us are early in our careers. Um, we've got some executives in the room, directors, and you know, you made it to the top. Um, and there's very few of us that are at the top of a publicly traded company. And, um, but to start at the beginning, what was your first role, and how did you start to navigate through Kaiser Permanente? Well, I first joined Kaiser Permanente really to get my master's degree in um, health services administration, and I needed to do an administrative residency program. And so I selected Kaiser Permanente uh, because we used Kaiser Permanente so much in our case studies. Hmm. So I went to the San Francisco Medical Center and fully just expecting to do a six month uh, residency program. So about three months into the program, I got involved in um, helping to open the open heart unit in San Francisco. Uh, and then one day the executive asked me to go in and do this massive assessment of one of the departments, the outpatient medical records department. Mm -hmm. So I went in and I did that assessment. I made a bunch of recommendations, like we all do when we're just getting started. You know, mm -hmm. we, Think know, we know everything. We know everything. <laughs> so I made all these great recommendations. And um, she said, really good job, now go implement. And I literally started a conversation with her and said, you know, it'll be very hard to implement this as mm -hmm. a resident. Mm -hmm. But as a manager, mm -hmm. I could make it happen. So I got hired as the manager. And That's pretty nice. Yeah, so <laughs> I started down that path. <laughs> I love that. And then what? So you became a manager. Um, you know, you, you had some recommendations. I said, okay, go do it. Yeah. And then what? Um, by the way, um, this executive was the chief executive officer. They call a hospital administrator of... Uh, Kaiser in San Francisco. Okay. She also happened to be African American. Oh, interesting. That's so beautiful. She gave me that first break. You guys don't have to be shy. We can clap for black <laughs> women. Okay, black women often putting each other she, on. That's a beautiful thing. She, she gave me that first break. And the reason why I talk about it is throughout my journey in Kaiser Permanente while she was there, mm -hmm. 
she was both a mentor and a sponsor. Right. And I talk to people a lot today about being a, the differences between a mentor and a sponsor. Mm. And hopefully um, in your careers, you will have both of those. So why don't you tell us the difference between the two? So um, mentor, what does that mean to you? Well, a, a, a mentor is a relationship with an individual in which you can feel free mm -hmm. to basically reflect on who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, um, how you behave, mm. basically the, the big thing. Uh, so, you know, you can lay out situations. Did I handle that correctly? How could I have done it differently? Something doesn't feel right, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So a mentor, I always tell people that I mentor that all I'm doing is putting a mirror out for you to look at yourself. Mm. And, and that's where I view a mentor. Mm -hmm. A sponsor is a person who speaks on your behalf when you're not there. Okay. So a sponsor is a person who's in the room of power. Right. And when a decision is about to be made, you know, who should we think about for this new job? Right. The sponsor is the person that would say, well, you know, uh, anyone consider Morgan? I mean, you know, and so the, the sponsor represents you. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk a lot about really everybody should seek to have a sponsor as you are moving through corporate America. Right. Um, how many of you all have a sponsor in your jobs? Do you feel like you have some sponsors? And how many of you all have mentors? Okay. So are they two separate people, two separate personality types? What should people look for when they are looking for a sponsor in a big you know, company that's got 50,000 plus employees? How does someone navigate that? It could be uh, two different people or one in the same. I've had both combinations. I've had mentors and sponsors throughout my career. Mm -hmm. um, as I grew higher in the organization, my sponsorship uh, started to be more and more outside of the organization. Okay. So for sure, um, as I was being considered for the CEO, mm -hmm. um, my mentor was a CEO of a major Fortune 50 company mm -hmm. who just really provided great mentorship and sponsorship mm -hmm. about how to think about the situation. Mm -hmm. And the advice was invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had both situations and, um, you know, and I've been in both situations where I've served as only a sponsor and in a couple of cases I'm the mentor and a sponsor. Okay, so you guys, you guys caught that? So for those of us who have mentors in um, other industries, um, what are some things that we need to be considering when we are looking for mentors? How does someone approach to someone to say, hey, Bernard, could you be my mentor? Yeah, you, you want someone who will be um, honest with you. So the whole point of a mentor is uh, we have a tendency to want to find people who would um, tell us we're okay. Mm. And right. the whole point of mentorship is, uh, the way I describe it is, uh, nobody knows you better than you and you really know who you are when you are by yourself. Hmm. And so we all wanna be better, you know, better in who we are and what we do, and we just wanna be better. You cannot be better if all you're doing is trying to find people that tell you how good you are. Hmm. You, you want people who <laughs> are willing to say, yep. um, I need to be critical about something. Mm -hmm. I talk to people all the time about, um, I am a professional business athlete. Okay, tell me more. I'm, I'm a professional business athlete. I'm no different than Steph Curry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, Steph, um, he's fantastic. Uh, he can drop that three mm -hmm. uh, anytime. But he doesn't just wake up and drop the three. He right. practices his skill. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, um, you can put me on a baseball mound, for example, and tell me that you know, somebody's going to throw a ball 100 miles an hour for me to hit it out the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I'll get nervous and shaky and everything else and stress out because I'm not a professional baseball player. Um, but you take me in a boardroom and give me a billion dollar problem mm -hmm. and tell me to hit it out the ballpark, I'll do it every time. Well, all right then. Um, would you like to be on the Blavity board? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let's talk about that. Our leaders, so you think leadership is a skill that can be taught and trained for. Um, how do we become better leaders? Like, what are the tools, the books, like what is the methodology that we should be taking to become leaders at that level? Yeah, I, there's some things about leadership I think you could be um, trained for, no mm -hmm. question about it. And you can hone the skills to be more effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody is perfect. And so you can also um, learn how to accommodate your deficiencies. Mm. Uh, but you can't do that if you don't acknowledge that you have those deficiencies. Okay. And so you, you always want to invest your time and energy in your strengths. Okay. And you want to deal with some of your deficiencies, mm -hmm. but you are basically who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, so you put the package together of leadership that requires you to do many things. Um, you figure out what you're really good at. And then if you're in a role where you have to build a team, mm -hmm. you build a team to accommodate those deficiencies that you have. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you spend as much time grooming your team uh, as you spend grooming yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with a powerful package. And that's really um, what you want. You know, I have a great team. Uh, my national executive team uh, very diverse, um, both with uh, race and gender diversity and um, you name it, I have it on my team. Uh, everybody comes to work on my team knowing I expect you to be who you are. Mm. So this thing about trying to fit in, um, I don't buy into that. Uh, uh, you know, I think that's been part of the challenge with close to the diversity movement mm -hmm. is that somebody has already defined a culture mm -hmm. and so when you're at it you are expected to, to fit in right. and to assimilate and so you can't be who you really are at times because mm -hmm. you're trying to accommodate the culture and the norm that's been created mm -hmm. so I work hard to say every time a new person comes on the team they get to come with their whole self and as a result, they're going to change the organism of the team. Right. And we got to figure out how to accommodate that. Right. So, the, you know, leadership at the top, I think, um, you know, a lot of the change comes from the top. The, the tone that you set has a trickle-down effect to all the managers and leadership. Um, I think some of us in this room may not be working at companies where the leadership at the top is as aware of the cultural nuances and actually people say a lot of stuff about wanting to bring your whole self to work. But then when you come with your hair and your outfits and your Balenciagas or whatever, then you get a lot of comments. Um, and that can be a burden for some people and I think many of us. And so how would you recommend that we, being you know, middle in the company, push forward to help that company that maybe we do really care about, we really do want to work there, but we're kind of tired of going up against just bringing ourselves to work every day, there's that burden. What advice would you give to those the people in the room that may feel that way? Well, you know, there's a balance. I mean, I, I've, uh, you know, I've seen some of the, uh, I'm bringing my whole self to work. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, pajamas at work is not what I'm talking about. Right. You know. Right. And, and uh, so, but but I mean, you know, I mean, <coughs> it's not that you don't have to create a culture, mm. right, and a norm. That's how you get stuff done, and but you have to keep pushing that paradigm in a smart way. Mm -hmm. uh, cultures are created by the dominant force and then everybody else has to comply, right? Mm. So you want to pay attention to who created the culture. I mean, right. part of the reason why um, um, 
you know, the debate that's going on in the country right now in corporate America is that most of the CEO jobs are still held by um, white men. Right. And, you know, and you ask the question, well, how is that? Mm -hmm. Well, you look at the culture and you look at the buildup uh, to that role and across so many industries and you can draw certain conclusions. And mm -hmm. it's not about that people didn't earn it and all those kind of things, but um, that's part of the culture of corporate America that many of us are trying to change now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're making slow progress, but it's hard work. I will tell you, when you have a diverse board, I have a very diverse board, mm -hmm. um, and they're tough as could be, but they're fair. And what I like about them is um, they are who they are as well. So they don't sit there and try to be nice and mm. kind and gentle. They're respectful, but they're very clear about expectations and um, um, giving me advice. Mm -hmm. And I seek advice. I mean, that's how a board can be so helpful with strategy. And, you know, we're a big, big organization. We have our revenue stream this year is about $85 billion, and uh, we have... Billion dollars. Yeah, 200... So y'all heard that. Money! We got 220... <laughs> <laughs> we have 220,000 employees, and... Woo! And um, in our permanent medical groups, we have, you know, about 27,000 physicians. Mm. And, um, so it's a big, gigantic operation. We have... We're, 75 million square feet of medical space wow. around the country. And, and so it takes a lot for, you know, this big mega health system to mm -hmm. deliver every single day, 24 seven. And so you want a board that can um, make sure that the CEO is staying focused on both long-term strategy and short-term hurdles that we have to deal with. And the board does that very well, and I would say in part because they are so diverse mm -hmm. that they bring that unique perspective into the environment. Right, right. So I want to get into health and, and technology. Um, how many of you in the room are entrepreneurs? Okay, so we have some entrepreneurs. So we have some future leaders in here. Um, what are the opportunities in healthcare that our community has? that we should be building technological solutions to? Oh, it's, the field is wide open. You know, when I got here this afternoon, um, I went and looked at our booth, of course. <laughs> of course. And, um, Shout out to the booth. Yeah, <laughs> and the fantastic team. <laughs> and hopefully everybody's going to go see this. We are opening up a medical school next year mm. in Southern California. We, um, we're going to have 48 students, you know, uh, to start the school. Mm -hmm. We have over 11,000 applicants already. Wow. For 48 slots. Wow. Right? Um, but when you stop by our booth right out here, you'll see the technology that we're putting in the medical school. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's clear that we're going to continue to put more and more generations of that technology uh, there but it's already here. While I was standing there, I met a gentleman who said that he has a startup company mm -hmm. that, um, I hate I'm forgetting his name right now. He said that he, that we did a pilot with him in Portland and he's moving, uh, we've agreed to implement his system in Northern California. Oh wow. So just to give you a size difference, Portland has about 700,000 members, mm -hmm. Northern California has uh, 4.8 million members. Okay, so he So be his well little staffed. startup, his, not his little startup company. <laughs> yes. yeah. His startup company started in Portland with us. Yes. And now he's moving it to Northern California. Wow, yeah, so, that's amazing. Um, you know, just really, really happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. And it's a medical device. And we don't just accept anything. And so clearly, it's of the highest standards. Mm -hmm. The um, startup companies are blooming everywhere right now, around the country and around the world. 
going after health care mm -hmm. because they see such tremendous opportunities in everything that we're trying to do. Everything from, you know, biotech related technology mm -hmm. to technology that helps us with um, logistics um, to specialty. Um, so it's, it's a big opportunity. We have a venture arm mm -hmm. as part of our organization. Um, I have about $400 million in there. We invest in companies mm -hmm. um, around the world. And uh, those companies usually then begin to provide services uh, inside of Kaiser Permanente, and we love doing it. So we got to get the information out to the Afrotech community about how to get involved with your venture arm and get their pitches to them. Um, so we'll make sure to follow up on that. So I want to talk a little bit about health care and equities within our community. And I know you all have a variety of initiatives and recently opened up a new um, Thrive Local. So could you tell us a little bit about Thrive Local and what that partnership means to us? We are unique in that we're, we're as I said, we're such a big mega health system. We take care of almost 13 million people. And we exist in communities in which 68 million people live. Mm. So we get a great view of the inequities uh, in this country. So you have one community where it has everything that one can imagine to thrive, right? So you have great uh, police service, mm -hmm. uh, grocery stores everywhere. Right. Um, you know, a gas station is truly a gas station and you feel safe to walk in the evenings and at night and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You go to another neighborhood and you, you almost can't get the street lights changed. Right. And there's no grocery store and um, crime is high. Mm -hmm. And um, in a lot of cases, those communities did not have a voice at the table when money was being divided up governmentally to fund all these programs. Mm -hmm. So Kaiser Permanente um, is playing a, a heavy advocacy role to make sure that we build what we call healthy communities for all of our communities because we know that health care can only do so much to help you with your health. Right. And so if you are living on um, fried chicken every day and Popeyes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Popeyes. Uh, <laughs> did I tell you the story about Popeyes? <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. But, but we're ready for it. Yeah, I, I did eat did Popeyes you? chicken. I was in Atlanta. Okay, so and, you got a good one. Uh, and I was to meet my beautiful wife in Boston, and they delayed the flight. I shouldn't tell you all this story. <laughs> they, they delayed the flight. And I'm on my way running to catch the plane. I sniffed that Popeye chicken, and <laughs> it, it smelled so good, but I kept going. And so, so the flight was delayed 30 minutes. 30 minutes went to an hour. An hour went to two hours. So I decided I would go down to Popeye chicken. So I went, and I got in line, long line. So when they got to me, I was reading the sign, and it said uh, dinner for two. It had chicken. It had all this kind of stuff. It said calories. 5,000 to 8,000. 5,000. So when I got in, the, I got up, the lady said, may I help you? <laughs> and, and I, and I, this is the truth. And I, and I said, I said, did I read that sign right? Did it say 5,000 to 8,000 calories? She said, yeah. I said, you all are killing people. Oh, no. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? And she said, do you want to order or not? Right, <laughs> right. And I said, give me six, six strips. <laughs> I said, I don't want no french fries, I don't want no anything. Right, no soda. And, and I thought these were going to be little strips. Yeah. It was like a platter of batter. Right. And I took a picture and I sent it to my wife. Yep. So I got to Boston later that night and Denise said, are you hungry? And I said, no, nah, I'm full. Right. She said, <laughs> she said, what did you do with that chicken? I said, sweetheart, I ate every single no! <laughs> no! That oh, chicken man. was so good. <laughs> So you're a Popeyes over Chick-fil-A then? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I might get in that long sandwich line. But um, 
but in these communities, is how do we, how do we um, really provide options mm -hmm. for people to make choices? That's right. And so that's really what Thrive Local is about, that we're working with our resources, community resources, and we're helping people to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you the program we're doing right now in, in Northern California I'm so excited about. We've targeted about 600,000 or so of our membership who qualify for SNAP, mm -hmm. right? This is where the government will give you money to buy healthy foods. Right. Well, the whole system is set up in a way that people don't feel comfortable going to do it. Um, it you have to go through these hurdles and everything. Well, we've been working with the state mm -hmm. to serve as a facilitator and an advocate for our members to have access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. We just started this program and we already have over 10,000 people on the program, right? And that's, that's real great. money. That's great. Is there an app for that? Can they get food delivery with the app? Well, that, we're going to do that next. So you guys start building this stuff Absolutely. and sell it. Yeah. That's a permanent day. <laughs> yeah. Right? No, th those things are, um, we just announced that we're going to do drones with UPS. Okay. Right? Tell us more. And somebody asked me, what are you going to do? I said, right. I don't know. <laughs> we're but, the drones. but we're going to have the drones doing something. <laughs> right. It's <laughs> dropping off food. Yeah, but that the whole it. point is, with all this technology, yeah. you can rethink how you want your business to work. Right. Right. And that's been the beauty of the technology now. It has allowed us to disrupt our organization. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening in organization. You basically, in the 19th and the 20th century, built organizations to conform and mm -hmm. comply, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, part of the third industrial revolution was mass production. And we're now in the fourth industrial revolution, we now have the kind of technology where you can disaggregate everything. And, and, and so, you know, we used to have all of our patients coming in. Mm -hmm. Now, over 50% of our interactions with patients are on the iPhone and the right. iPads and technology. Uh, it's a whole different mindset that you can establish and operating procedures on the platform of technology. And so I would encourage people to keep innovating in this area. So let's talk about that, though. So if we are becoming more, everything's more accessible on your mobile phones and through the Internet, how do we make sure that our communities who don't always have access to mobile phones, high internet, and um, laptops at home, and maybe they have one computer for the whole family. Um, how do we make sure that the health inequities don't actually get exacerbated by the digital divide? Yeah, everybody needs to speak up loudly about that. Uh, you, you should not um, hold back on that. It's something that I pay attention to a lot. Mm -hmm. And we can do so much because we're such a big organization. Right now, what we're doing is, to your point, we're looking at the infrastructure in communities of color mm -hmm. to see, do you have the internet capability? That's right. So there are many communities uh, in California mm -hmm. where you don't have access to the internet because right. the infrastructure was passed by. That's and right. so it's those kind of things to really advocating that this has historically been a problem that we are the afterthought. Mm -hmm. And so it requires um, explicit advocacy. Right. And is that something that Thrive will be doing? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little about mental health. You all are doing quite a bit when it comes to wellness and mental health in the African American community and, and beyond. Can you talk a little bit about where that passion comes from and um, what your kind of temple themes and, and things that you all are doing are? Yeah. We have been. Um, working forever, but in particular over the last five to seven years, doubling down on mental health. It, it's an area where if you look at the entire industry and history, we got this part wrong. Um, we, in essence, disconnected the head from the body. Mm. And we treated mental health like it was some bad thing that we put a negative connotation around it and then we put we put separate medical records to take care of it, and you had to go someplace for right. mental health services, and right. you didn't want to let anybody know that you had something going on. And 
you know, we've heard all the negative terms and everything associated with uh, mental health. And so what we find ourselves with today as a society, that mental health and wellness is the number one issue in healthcare today. Mm -hmm. It's everything from um, mild depression to suicide. And then before suicide, it's also the number one issue on Alzheimer's. Hmm. which is a form of mental health. Oh, I didn't realize that. We, we have now, um, last year in the United States, um, about 45,000 people uh, took their lives, hmm. died by suicide, 45,000. Just to yeah. give you a sense, about 20,000 were killed. Wow. So there are over twice as many people killing themselves than people who are killed. Mm -hmm. Suicide is the number one cause of death for young girls now between the ages of 15 and 21. Wow. And it's number two for all young people between the age of 12 and 26. Wow. Um, depression is the number one payout for disabilities in corporate America. It's a massive problem. No matter what audience I'm in, if I ask you to raise your hand, if you know of someone, if it's you, if it's a family member, a neighbor, church member, etc., that you know have some form of mental health. In fact, let me ask, you heard the question, would you raise your hand that knows that? See? Mm -hmm. Every single audience I go to, it's pervasive everywhere. That's and right. so what we're doing is we have celebrities that's working with us on destigmatizing mental health. Mm -hmm. We have Steph Curry, we have Kendrick Lamar, we have, uh, we got, Kendrick was the first one that let us use one of his songs mm -hmm. um, when we kicked off the stigma uh, situation. And we are using those kind of personalities because they have cachet and they're helping people to say, it's okay, find your words and mm -hmm. get some help. And then we are redesigning our whole mental health systems into the operations. And so it will be as natural as when you go see a, um, general practitioner mm -hmm. and you have something that's going on. You know, I went to see my doctor recently and uh, I had a, a, a little mold as it turned out and I thought it was a big deal on my belly button and I was like, oh, what is this? And she said, can I get the Roman dermatologist to come take a quick look at it? And I said, yeah, please, because this is bad. And, and <laughs> so, so she. So the dermatologist came and he took one look at it and he said, um, it's actually nothing, it's just a little mold. Mm -hmm. And he said, I could remove it or you could just leave it alone. So I said, so it's not tied to my intestines, it's not gonna kill me? Right. And he said, no, it's not gonna kill you. Then he left, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing we wanna do with mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking to your doctor, how are you sleeping? I'm not sleeping well, how are you eating? I don't eat anymore. Are you stressed? Yeah, I got a lot of problems. Well, what if I ask Dr. Jane to come in, spend a few minutes, kind of get her arms around what's going on, mm. and we can offer you some ideas about how to deal with that. We want to make it that natural. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. So um, I want to ask one more question. So this room is full of some of the top black talent in the world. What are the things that we need to be doing most immediately in the next year to make sure that we are in a position to be leaders in the future? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a great question. And I have to say, I'm so proud of you and so proud of what you've done and that you did it here in Oakland, California. Thank you. You know, uh, I just got my board to approve. We're uh, building a massive, uh, Thrive uh, Center building yes. here in Oakland. We're keeping it in Oakland. Uh, 7,000 jobs are staying in Oakland. We're committed to Oakland for, um, for all the right reasons mm -hmm. and to our communities. You know, now is the time more than ever for uh, all of us in the room to take on an additional role of aggressiveness. Yes. The, number one, there's just a lot of money out there. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, investors are just, you know, they're looking yes, uh, for things to invest in. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not money isn't out there. The issue is the connection of that money 
to what you're trying to do. To us. And to us and to the value proposition. And so I would strongly recommend that you continue to push hard in those connections, especially with bright ideas and everything to come. I think at the more global level, it's um, still very hard for uh, minorities and particular African Americans uh, to tap into those investment funds. Mm -hmm. uh, they just don't come at the you know at the same uh, level, and um, you know, and I see it. I see it in corporate America. I, I see it with my lovely wife who's working on something, and she's banging on doors and and everything. Uh, she has one investor right now. <laughs> Shout out to the partner. <laughs> but I'm looking for a dividend now. <laughs> well, startups don't pay dividends. Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> but but uh, just keep pushing. And yes. also, this is uh, in the midst of all the challenges. This is also a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a bifurcated country right now, and not everybody's doing bad. And um, so tap into that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time. Uh, don't accept that people are living below a standard. You know, we launched the uh, homeless program, and it's a commitment that in every one of the communities that Kaiser Permanente exists, we're just not going to have homeless people. Mm. That's what we said. And that's what we're working on. Ambitious. And w we built a case around it because it's directly associated with health, right? If you don't have a shelter over your head, the likelihood that you're going to be healthy is slim to none. We have all the data to show that your lifespan is cut 10 to 20 years mm -hmm. by being homeless, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then all the diseases and everything. So we can argue from the health standpoint and justify why we would spend money right. to eradicate this problem. But for me, it's a bigger issue. It's what kind of society do we want to be? Mm -hmm. in the 21st century and 50 years from now how do we want history to say what we did while we were here mm -hmm. and so while I'm here I don't think it's acceptable for anyone to sleep on the streets of America at night in the wealthiest country in the world yes okay. that's great. and so that's what we can do in terms of working on uh, these kinds of issues and go for it and, and let's get ours all right, let's get ours. You heard it. All right, Bernardo, thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you to your family and to the whole Kaiser Permanente team for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. It was great being here.